I was born in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, but my parents moved down here when I was five to Rockford, Illinois. So I've grown up here, uh, went to St. Bernadette's, and then I went to a Catholic seminary for high school in La Crosse, Wisconsin, until I discovered girls, and then I thought, well, maybe a, being a priest isn't what I want to be. And it took me a while to kind of figure out what to do. I was in a factory at Atwood, uh, working uh, a assembly line job and uh, one day I just thought I'm going to enlist in the army and so the February of 1969 that's when I went in. I read everything and I thought oh yeah we have to fight the communists and I've been raised on John Wayne and you know we we're always the good guys and stuff so it was easy to hear the history from that viewpoint and saying the communists are the enemy and we have to use whatever means, especially military, to try and fight them. The war in Vietnam is a combined and joint effort, whatever you are. Soldier, sailor, marine, or airman, American, you already know this well. In the early phase of the war, the Viet Cong proved themselves adept at using those weapons simply by persuading the people that they were their friends and protectors who would help to bring them a better life. The real objectives of communism were always underplayed or obscured entirely. They're still doing that as much as they can. But one factor has changed the direction of the war significantly. The big buildup of American forces. this special responsibility does mean that firepower of all kinds has to be employed with care taken in so far as humanly possible to avoid unnecessary damage to the lives and property of the civilian population. For the blunt truth is that death or injury to helpless civilians, even when it is unavoidable, works against us. This knowledge is simply one of the conditions of war which we must accept and work with as best we can. swallowed that hook, line, and sinker for three years. At the time, there were lots of draftees in the basic training unit. I was like uh, what they call an RA, a regular army, meaning I had enlisted for three years. Everyone else was U.S. They had been drafted. So I stood out like a sore thumb. I think they offered like a chance to pick a skill. And I, I said, well, I'm, I want to be a policeman. When I get out, I'll enlist in the military police. And when you first go in, they take you to the, uh, into Chicago and they, like Arlo Guthrie says, they inspect you and deject you and reject you. And for the whole day I was standing there and then they came up and measured me and said, you're half an inch too short to be in the police. Choose something else. So I looked through this list of jobs and said, ooh, personnel management specialist. That sounds important, so I'll pick that. I went to Fort Leonard Wood for basic training. I was the fittest I'd ever been and ever probably will be. And then they sent me to a personnel training school and then they sent me to Germany. And I was kind of disappointed because I thought I was going to be sent to Vietnam. And even as a clerk, you'd still have a chance of, you know, defending the country and learning about the issues and stuff. I didn't like the Army so much. I was a good soldier, but I, I thought I could volunteer for Vietnam and not actually get sent out on the front lines. And I could serve my 12 months there and then I'd come home early and get out of the Army four months. The military duty, we had to uh, take care of paperwork, and I, I was assigned to this group of units and uh, the hospitals and some of the uh, medevac units. And so I had to take paperwork to one of the hospitals one time, and it was right after I got in country, and I went there with another new guy, and uh, we'd 
I can't remember how we got there, but we were in the hospital looking out to the heliport and a helicopter landed and these guys carried wounded soldiers off and one of them had his shirt up with a little pink hole right in his belly. And I thought, is this worth it? Is this, I mean, these people are getting hurt. So, whereas I was very conservative and I thought we got to stop the communists from taking over Vietnam, I thought, is it worth this, this pain and suffering? And I saw when I pulled guard duty, uh, I remember one night I was up in a, a platform overlooking a fence, overlooking a village that was like full of refugees from around the country. And the, I witnessed the South Vietnamese police going in there, at least I assumed they were South Vietnamese police, and they were just beating the heck out of these women and children. And I ran across these guys that came back from the field. Now, I was called a REMF, a Rear Echelon MF. And we kept our distance from the grunts, the ones that grunted under the pressure of carrying guns out in the field. But I, so I kind of kept my distance, and I heard these guys yelling about the gooks and killing all and letting God sorting them out. And I thought, here we have the best trained men, they were all men, that our country has to offer. And this war is turning them into racist. And I thought, this is horribly wrong. And so that's when I really started questioning the war. was to stop the communists in Vietnam. The soldiers that I heard talking about killing all the gooks were equating the South Vietnamese as all the enemy. So the mission in their minds was to kill everyone. And I think if the, some of the top brass led them, they did. And we had the firepower there. So I just immersed myself in that history. And I kept on doing my job, which was an easy job. I mean, it wasn't dangerous. When I returned from Vietnam, I felt that I had to help stop the war. And I felt that empowered because I had been there and I had served my time and I had gotten an honorable discharge. I didn't like the fact that my religion, my schooling, my community had sent me to Vietnam. So when I came back, the first thing I wanted to go to Rock Valley College and start my education, but I also wanted to find other veterans 
like me, that didn't like the war. And I knew that there was a group called Vietnam Veterans Against the War, so I kind of searched them out. There weren't very many people here in Rockford like that. There were anti-war activists, but they were kind of associated with the local Unitarian Church. And I went to a few of those demonstrations, found some people that would go with me into Chicago, and that's where I found other veterans that uh, were protesting the war at the time. The veterans who came back, then we formed our own groups. We had our own demonstrations. When uh, we went down to the Miami for the big protest in 1972, Richard Nixon had just been renominated at the Republican convention in Miami. Protesters were down there by the thousands. There were three groups. There were the Yippies, stoned out of their gourd, led by A.B. Hoffman, the Vietnam veterans set up an encampment, had like, it was like a small army, and then the SDSers, or the socialists. Ron Kova was leading the Vietnam veterans to the Hotel Fontainebleau. We were gonna storm the Hotel Fontainebleau. Uh, we got in front of the Hotel Fontainebleau and the Miami police kind of like, they didn't want to deal with us. So here comes McCloskey. He's a rep Republican congressman from California, the only anti-war Republican congressman. But he's out there talking to all the leadership. And then say, they say, OK, we're going to turn around and go back to our encampment. That was exciting. <laughs> that was great to see. And I learned a lot of tactics to what works and what doesn't work. Nonviolence is the best way to go. Every time you do violence, you lose half the family members with young kids because they don't want violence to harm their kids. Uh, you got a good chance of harming your own people. Well, I think that first you have to start out with education and then aim for legislations that will make things better. And if that doesn't work, if you run up against people that won't pay attention, then the last thing is a protest on the street. The soldiers, especially, first of all, the Veterans for Peace and the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, wanted to go back and see Vietnam at peace. So they began sneaking into the country. And I was on the second group that went over. The Vietnamese veterans wanted to see us the most. So wherever we went, when they heard that there was a group of Vietnam veterans who were against the war when they went back, we were like wined and dined, except for one place. This general was supposed to show us around. Well, he didn't like us, and he showed up in a huff, and he was real angry. We were headed out, and I remember that the foliage got less and less as we got closer and closer to this big, dark hill, and there's still nothing growing. And the general got out and threw an interpreter. He was yelling at David about, you killed a lot of my friends. And David was right big at him, you killed a lot of my friends. And I thought they were going to start you know, a whole nother war. Then the general took us around to the other side of the mountain. Dave said, I'd never been to this side. And we got out, and there was a cemetery there for his troops. And I'd seen how they celebrated or commemorated their dead. They usually have a big pot of sand and you get incense sticks, you light the incense sticks, you gotta break up the sand. Usually there's a stone there and you break up the sand and then you stick the incense sticks in there. So I said, come on guys, let's go over here and we lit the incense sticks and um, then stood there and just said a few words and we turned around and the general was crying. And he said, the war's over for me. And he took us out to lunch. That was the best part of the whole trip. I found that by helping people, 
by working with a food pantry and a soup kitchen. That kind of healed some of my anger. I hung around the churches and one day I heard a folk singer singing about a God that hated war and loved the poor and that's when I stood up. 